In this Elden Ring video, I'm going to be showing you why straight swords are the best weapon in the Elden Ring. This is the 10th video in our series where we go through each weapon in a given weapon category and sort of tell you guys the pros and cons of each of those weapons to help you make a better informed decision about whether or not you want to use that weapon in your build. I know people have been waiting for this video for quite a while now, and it is finally here. Before we get into the weapons themselves, however, let's talk a little bit about the pros and cons of this weapon category and the ways I think most people will use straight swords in Elden Ring. So firstly, straight swords have a rather light weight in Elden Ring, meaning that it doesn't take a lot of equip load in order to use them. They range from about 2.5 to 5.5, which isn't very much weight. So there's that. They also have very good hitboxes, usually slashing like left to right or right to left in sort of a 45 degree angle that'll tend to hit things that are up above you or below you with that attack, which is really nice, making them hit the hitboxes of enemies a lot more reliably than some other weapon types. They also attack a lot faster than a lot of other weapons, allowing you to R1 spam a lot of enemies to death without ever getting hit. They also have a bit longer reach than some other weapons like axes, maces, or curved swords, allowing them to hit a little bit further. Additionally, quite a few of these weapons have thrust attacks in addition to slashing attacks, giving you a different damage type against enemies that might resist one or the other. Moving along to the cons of straight swords, first up is status effects. They typically don't support status effect play as well as some other weapon types. That's not to say that you can't make a status effect build with straight swords, but they don't attack as rapidly as some others, and a lot of straight swords, most of them, the vast majority, don't have native status effect buildup on them, meaning you're gonna have to add them via Ashes of War, which typically reduces the damage of a lot of weapons. And also the dual wield moveset of straight swords isn't as good as twin blades or curved swords at applying status effects. So if you want a status effect buildup, you're better off going with one of those two weapon types than you are with straight swords, even though you can do it with straight swords if you want. And lastly, they deal a lot less damage than many different weapon types in the game. Great swords, colossal weapons, halberds, reapers, a lot of spears, a lot of twin blades, katanas, a lot of different weapons deal more damage than straight swords. And because they don't excel at status effect buildup, it puts them in this weird place in the middle where they're not good at like jump attack one shot builds or one shot builds, and they're not good at status effect buildup, but they're somewhere in the middle. So they're kind of like C plus B tier at both of these things when, you know, a great sword is A plus at this type and a curved sword is A plus at status effect buildup. Talking a bit about the styles of play that most people will use with straight swords, most people, in my opinion, will use straight swords with either a shield or they'll dual wield straight swords. And that's because straight swords just lend themselves very well to a block counter style of build. They aren't, like, meant, as I mentioned, ever really going to one-shot too many things with a jump attack sort of build unless you're dual wielding. And dual wielding gives you the option to not only do those jump attacks, but also do some status effect buildup because even though their attacks aren't as good as curved swords or twin blades at setting status effects, they're still pretty good. And it also allows you to use things like the Winged Sword Insignia and Talismans like that that build up your attack power with repeated strikes a lot more easily. Getting their attack power higher and putting them into like a higher class of weapon essentially when that buffs up so that they're attacking faster than those other weapon classes, but they're dealing the same or more damage. Those things being said, let's jump into the unique straight swords first and talk a little bit about those. First up is the Lazuli Glintstone Sword. The Lazuli Glintstone Sword has an R2 that blocks incoming attacks before striking and deals physical and magic damage. It's a light straight sword in Elden Ring weighing 3.5 and requires points in strength, dexterity, and intelligence in order to use. The Lazuli Glintstone Sword is an interesting weapon because it has rather high attack rating for a straight sword, but it doesn't have very long reach, and it has an R2 attack that blocks incoming attacks before attacking, which is improved by two-handing the weapon or by using the Great Shield Talisman. However, it has terrible protection and guard boost natively, making it a strange choice to use for blocking. This makes its R2 less useful than other weapons. Glintstone Pebble is a decent weapon skill that is very inexpensive FP-wise, and the projectile portion is improved by increasing intelligence and magic damage, but not strength, dexterity, or physical damage. While the follow-up attack seems to be the same ratio of physical and magic damage as the weapon itself, that is to say, depending on how you're set up, about 55% magic damage and 45% physical damage, and you'll get more damage out of this no matter whether you pump strength, dexterity, intelligence, or increase physical or magic damage. The sweet spot for this weapon is right around 50 strength and 50 intelligence, with both intelligence and strength adding roughly the same amount of damage between about 30 to 50 of each stat, despite intelligence having D scaling and strength having C. However, you could take intelligence higher, sacrificing some melee damage in exchange for better sorcery scaling, 
which I advise if you wish to make a Spellblade build using this weapon. I'd recommend you farm two of these weapons and dual wield them for very high attack rating with straight swords, or you can use them with a great shield for block counters since you also have a decent amount of strength, and most great shields require strength in order to wield. However, of the two, dual wielding is arguably better since the Lazuli Glintstone Sword has very short reach, making you often miss a lot of your block counter attacks. And because it scales decently with both strength and intelligence and dexterity, you can use this weapon effectively in NG+, as its damage will continue to improve as you level up, albeit at a slower pace. Next up is the Carrion Knight Sword. The Carrion Knight Sword has an R2 that blocks incoming attacks before striking, similar to the Lazuli Glenstone Sword, and deals physical and magic damage. It has an average weight for a straight sword in Elden Ring Wing 4, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and intelligence in order to use. The Carrion Knight Sword outperforms the Lazuli Glintstone Sword in terms of attack rating, but shares the same blocking R2 attack that makes R2s a bit strange, and not likely to be used for blocking specifically. It also has exceptional attack rating at minimum requirements with a whopping 505, which is a lot for a weapon that weighs 4. However, Carrion Grandeur, its weapon skill, does less damage with the same stats than any other cold or magic-infused straight sword. Additionally, it does 100% magic damage and doesn't increase with strength or dexterity, and what this means is that you lose attack rating to get more carry and grander damage, or you lose carry and grander damage to get more attack rating, which is far from ideal and isn't an issue for magic infused straight swords. In short, if you really like carry and grander, I advise using a magic or cold infused straight sword instead of this weapon. Note that this weapon skill benefits from Godfrey Icon, so make sure to use it. It also is quite expensive at 26 FP, so you may want to use carry and filigreed crest to bring that cost down and make sure to use Magic Scorpion Charm for added damage. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 Strength, 50 Dexterity, and 50 Intelligence, which won't be reached until NG+, making it a great weapon for successive playthroughs. And as I mentioned earlier, it has very high damage at minimum requirements, making it a good choice for low-level players. Much like the Lazuli Glintstone Sword, you can favor Intelligence for more carry and grander damage and sorcery scaling if you go the Spellblade route, but you lose attack rating this way, and you might be better off with a Magic Infused Straight Sword, with better intelligence scaling if you go this route. Much like the Lazuli Glintstone Sword, the Carrion Knight Sword works best in a dual wield setup or a block counter build with a great shield due to its high attack rating and strength scaling, but can also be used in a Spellblade build, though not completely optimal. Next up is the Crystal Sword. The Crystal Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical and magic damage. It's one of the heavier straight swords in Elden Ring Wang 4.5 and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and intelligence in order to use. The Crystal Sword has one of the highest attack ratings of unique straight swords that deal magic damage, has the best strength scaling of the bunch, but is in the middle of the pack when it comes to straight sword length. It has a normal R2 attack, which I think is an improvement over the Lazuli Glintstone Sword and Carrion Knight Sword, adding another reason to use it. Its weapon skill spinning slash is not particularly effective, especially because the weapon doesn't have the greatest reach, but it can work in a pinch if you have high enough poise. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 Strength, 50 Dexterity, and 50 Intelligence, which won't be reached until NG+, making it a great weapon for successive playthroughs. Because it has much better Strength scaling than Intelligence, I don't recommend using this in a Spellblade build or you'll lose more attack rating than you would if you were using the Lazuli Glintstone Sword or the Carrion Knight Sword in a Spellblade type build. The Crystal Sword works best in a dual wield setup due to its high attack rating and strength scaling just because its length is not that great and Spinning Slash isn't as effective of a weapon skill, making a block counter shield setup less effective than the previous two weapons. This will let you lean into L1 attacks that hit for lots of damage while using another straight sword in your main hand that has a better Ash of War. Next up is the Rotten Crystal Sword. The Rotten Crystal Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical and magical damage. It's one of the heavier straight swords in Elden Ring, weighing 4.5, and requires some points in strength and dexterity and intelligence in order to wield. For all intents and purposes, the Rotten Crystal Sword operates nearly identically as the Crystal Sword. They have the same appearance except for the color, they are the same length, they share almost the same exact scaling and weapon skill. The only real difference is that the Rotten Crystal Sword adds Scarlet Rot buildup to its attacks, has slightly lower attack rating, and isn't found until the very end of the game. Because of this, you're almost always better off with the Crystal Sword on regular enemies while using the Rotten Crystal Sword on bosses in NG+, or when cooperating, where they have higher health pools and Scarlet Rot can really put in some work. Spinning Slash is also a better weapon skill in this weapon compared to the Crystal Sword, because it allows you to strike rapidly building up Scarlet Rot more quickly than if you were just attacking with R1 attacks, though not by much. In short, the Rotten Crystal Sword, while dealing less damage than the Crystal Sword, trades outright damage for Scarlet Rot. 
This is really only helpful in boss encounters where enemies live long enough to benefit from this or in PvP where it can pressure players. Otherwise, you're better off going with the Crystal Sword, particularly because there are no other straight swords that have Scarlet Rot buildup on them that you can pair it with. Next we have the Mikkelen Knight Sword. The Mikkelen Knight Sword has a unique R2 attack that lunges and slashes forward when charged and deals physical and holy damage. It is a light straight sword in Elden Ring weighing 3.5 and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. The Mikkelen Knight Sword deals fairly good damage, has great reach for a straight sword, and has a unique R2 attack that can pull you closer to enemies, allowing you to use it more easily while standing outside their attack range. You'll also only need 9 more faith in order to be able to use Golden Vow, which will boost your damage by another 15%. However, it does deal about 30% of its damage as holy, which isn't a good damage type in Elden Ring, and Sacred Blade only increases this more. Sacred Blade is a much better weapon skill since patch 1.07 as it's had its speed and range increased, the blade can now connect for damage making it great at point blank range, and it now adds 90 holy damage to your attacks instead of 85 and lasts twice as long at 40 seconds. However, this weapon has terrible faith scaling, and the damage of Sacred Blade is not increased by strength or dexterity, only the faith attribute. The Sacred Scorpion Charm is not a bad choice to use here, as it can boost this weapon's skills damage by a good amount since it's 100% holy damage. The sweet spot for this weapon is around 50 strength and 50 dexterity, as the faith scaling is extremely poor. However, as I mentioned, Sacred Blade scales with faith, which isn't optimal. Additionally, if you want to be able to cast any incantations effectively with the Claw Mark Seal, you'll need to split your stats between strength and faith, which gives you a lower attack rating. This forces you to make a tough decision about optimizing between the weapon's damage itself or Sacred Blade's damage and incantation scaling. I recommend splitting your attributes between Strength and Faith in order to be able to use incantations and for more Sacred Blade damage. The difference between optimal stat spread for the weapon itself and for spellcasting is not that much damage, and being able to cast incantations will more than make up for this. Either go for a Spellblade type build that uses incantations and Sacred Blade, or grab a Great Shield and block counter, since you'll have high strength, using Sacred Blade for your ranged attacks, or combine both into one build that can do it all, ergo a Paladin build. Next up is the Ornamental Straight Sword. The Ornamental Straight Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical damage. It's a very light straight sword in Elden Ring Wing 3, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Ornamental Straight Sword has some really amazing features, even though it's one of the lowest attack power straight swords, and even though it doesn't have very long reach. It's one of two paired weapons that aren't claws or fists, and the R2 attacks hit with both weapons if Golden Tempering has been used, even if you're only one-handing the weapon. Golden Tempering was buffed in patch 1.07 to be faster, deal more poise damage, and now adds 100 holy damage instead of 85 to your weapon attacks, and now lasts 60 seconds. In short, this weapon skill was already strong as we showcased in our Golden Champion build, but now it's even stronger. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 dexterity, but you can take this all the way to 80 dexterity effectively, though you aren't going to get much more damage out of it after this point, with both strength and dexterity giving you about 1 point of damage per point invested after this. This means the weapon is much better in a first playthrough than it will be in NG Plus or beyond, though you can still increase your damage a bit in these playthroughs. Personally, I like to use this weapon with a shield in my offhand. This allows you to use a shield in the offhand while you're still dealing damage with R2s as if you're dual wielding. You can use the Jellyfish Shield for an additional 20% damage, for example. Additionally, your offhand will remain buffed for the duration, even if you stop dual wielding, allowing you to swap back and forth at will. The next straight sword is the Golden Epitaph. The Golden Epitaph shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical and holy damage. It's a light straight sword in Elden Ring Wing 3.5, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, and faith in order to wield. The Golden Epitaph is in a strange place because it has high attack rating, but it does a fair bit of holy damage, which is less than ideal. On top of this, its weapon Skill Last Right does not stack with Golden Vow, which is a better buff and is obtained earlier than Golden Epitaph. This makes this weapon really only useful for builds that don't intend to increase their faith to 25, which would likely be few given that you need 14 in order to wield this weapon effectively, or when you're facing undead enemies. Still, the weapon only has slightly less damage than a Sacred Longsword and has longer reach, so if you weren't factoring in Golden Vow the spell, it would sort of be a trade-off. Last Rites was buffed in patch 1.07 though, increasing its duration to 60 seconds, adding 10% damage to your attacks and spells, and increasing the damage you deal versus Undead by a whopping 100%. That's on top of the 25 holy damage it adds to both weapons you are holding. This all looks great on paper, but the Golden Vow Ash of War gives you and party members 12.5% damage and 7.5% protection, lasts 45 seconds and costs 40 FP. 
The spell gives you and party members 15% damage and 10% protection and lasts 80 seconds, but still costs the same 40 FP. Which means if you can use the spell, then there is no reason to use last rites, since they don't stack unless you are simply facing undead enemies. The sweet spot for this weapon is right around 50 strength, 50 dexterity, and 50 faith, meaning you ideally use this in some sort of build that takes advantage of incantations, which should include Golden Vow, and you likely won't reach the optimal stat spread for this weapon until NG+. Note that Faith has much, much better scaling than either Dexterity or Strength, which both have nearly identical scaling. In my opinion, the best way to use this weapon is in a sword and board setup where you can rebuff your damage easily without having to swap to a Sacred Seal, even if your Faith is high enough to use Golden Vow. Or when using a weapon skill on your shield like Barricade Shield, since you can swap between two-handing and buff, and then swap back while retaining the buff. Just make sure you have enough Strength to use a Great Shield if you do this. You can reach around 1k attack rating this way by the end of the game, if you use the Jellyfish Shield. Next is the Sword of St. Trina. The Sword of St. Trina shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical and magic damage. It's a very light straight sword in Elden Ring Wang 3 and requires some points in Strength and Dexterity and Intelligence in order to use. The Sword of St. Trina is near the bottom in terms of unique straight swords attack rating and has very short reach. However, it does have sleep buildup on every hit, which can be a game changer in Elden Ring as a surprising amount of enemies are affected by it, even if they can't be completely put to sleep. These enemies usually stagger slightly, allowing for extra attacks or backstabs if you're quick. Mists of Slumber not only deals damage, but it does some sleep buildup in a small AoE and adds an additional 70 sleep buildup to your attacks for 30 seconds, which over doubles your sleep buildup per hit. This allows you to build up sleep much more easily on hard to kill enemies, even if you have to buff with it out of melee range. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 strength and 50 dexterity, making it a quality weapon for all intents and purposes as the intelligence scaling is extremely poor. For this reason, I don't recommend using this weapon in any sort of Spellblade build that also uses sorceries, since you'll sacrifice melee damage, and you don't have much as it is. I'd recommend using this in a Sword and Shield build that focuses on R1 attacks to build up sleep quickly while also doing block counters, or in a dual wield setup if you can get two of these, such as an NG+, or if another player drops one. Next is the Regalia of Aochade. The Regalia of Aochade shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical and magic damage. It's the heaviest straight sword in Elden Ring Wang 5.5, and requires some points in Strength, Dexterity, and Arcane in order to wield. The Regalia of Aochade has high attack rating, but has a short reach and is the heaviest straight sword in Elden Ring. However, you can get it quite early in Elden Ring with a little jumping, and it has one of the deadliest weapon skills in the game in Aochade's Dancing Blade. Aochade's Dancing Blade not only hits repeatedly, allowing you to make excellent use of Rotten Wing Sword Insignia, Millicent's Prosthesis, and the Thorny Crack Tier, it can also be charged for longer spins, allowing it to hit more times and increase its damage via Godfrey Icon. This allows you to defeat bosses in one or two casts of this ability if you can land the whole thing. The sweet spot for this weapon is about 50 Arcane, though 80 Arcane still gives decent damage, and Dexterity is also not bad once you've reached 50 Arcane, allowing this weapon to progress into NG+, and beyond just fine. Because you need so much Arcane for this build, it makes a great pairing with the Dragon Communion Seal, which scales off mostly Arcane, and with Dragon Spells since they don't require many points in Faith in order to use, like I showcased in my Dragon Dancer build. You could also use this with a shield and just focus on using the weapon skill when needed, since spells are nice, but a bit overkill with this weapon skill in many cases. Up next is the Coated Sword. The Coated Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals holy damage. It's the lightest straight sword in Elden Ring Wang 2.5, and requires some points in Faith in order to wield. The Coated Sword might be the most unique straight sword in Elden Ring if you don't include the Ornamental Straight Sword. It deals 100% holy damage and only scales with the Faith attribute, making it perfectly suited for Faith casters who will pump this attribute anyways. Its normal attacks are not repelled by shields, and its weapon skill Unblockable Blade goes through them. Unblockable Blade was buffed in patch 1.07 and now has a reduced FP cost at 18, and the motion speed and weapon skill itself is much faster, allowing for it to be used more often and more easily. The ability itself doesn't deal a ton of damage, though it's nothing to sneeze at, and its medium range allows you to begin swinging before enemies get too close to you. The sweet spot for this weapon is around 50 faith, at which point the damage begins to drop off significantly, making this a much better weapon for a first playthrough than NG+. However, you don't get it until very late in the game, so you won't be able to use it for most of a first playthrough. I'd pair this with the Erd Tree Seal for high incantation scaling and decent damage with a straight sword. You can even use a shield if you want, as long as you have enough strength. Make sure to use the Sacred Scorpion Seal for increased damage and to use the Holy Shroud and Crack Tier often to boost your damage even more. Since you deal 100% holy damage with your weapon attacks, you will get 100% efficacy out of these items. And of course, the last unique straight sword is the Sword of Night and Flame. 
The Sword of Night and Flame shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical, magic, and fire damage. It has an average weight for a straight sword in Elden Ring Wing 4, and requires some points in strength, dexterity, intelligence, and faith in order to wield. The Sword of Night and Flame is legendary in Elden Ring and for good reason. It has the highest attack rating for a straight sword, particularly at minimum requirements where it deals 615 damage, and its weapon skill, Night and Flame Stance, is deadly, dealing either fire or magic damage, depending on what the situation calls for. The caveat is that it doesn't scale well with strength or dexterity, but rather intelligence and faith instead, making this weapon much more suited to a spellcaster than a pure melee build. Night and Flame Stance was nerfed and then rebuffed in patch 1.07, increasing its damage once again. The Night Comet ability allows you to shoot a stream of magic forward, giving you a very good range for such a short weapon, and the Fire Sweep ability is excellent at AoEing down groups of enemies and those weak to fire damage. The sweet spot for the Sword of Night and Flame is around 50 Intelligence and 50 Faith, after which point it barely gains any damage from these attributes. However, because it's a great pairing with the Prince of Death staff, you'll likely take these stats higher in New Game Plus in order to get the most from this staff. I'd pair this weapon with a Carrion Regal Scepter in my first playthrough prioritizing Intelligence once the requirements for the weapon have been met, and then swapping to the Prince of Death staff in New Game Plus when you have more Faith. This will allow you to cast spells very well with high sorcery scaling, and still use the sword effectively. You can also pair it with a shield if you want, though your block counters won't be as good as if you're using a great shield, which you won't be able to do because you have very low strength. Next up, let's move to the infusible straight swords. The first one is the short sword. The short sword's R2 attacks are both thrust unlike most other straight swords, and it deals physical damage. It's a very light straight sword in Elden Ring Wing 3, and requires a few points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. The short sword has the shortest reach of all straight swords, it has some of the lowest damage of all straight swords, but it does have a few things going for it. It's lightweight, it has low requirements, it can deal thrust damage with R2s, and it's easy to acquire. However, nearly every other straight sword has longer reach and higher attack rating. So long as you can spare the extra 0.5 equip load, the longsword is already an upgrade. The Sacred and Flame Art Infusions are at the top of the list when it comes to total attack rating for this weapon, followed closely by Fire and Lightning and Magic. The weapon also scales better with the Keen Infusion when compared to Heavy. If you insist on using this weapon, I recommend using it in a dual wield build that focuses on low equip load trying to make use of the Blue Dancer Charm, since this weapon doesn't weigh much. You could also cast some incantations if you use the Sacred of Flame Art Affinities, which have the most damage, and there are Sacred Seals that weigh zero so they won't add to your equip load. Up next is the Long Sword. The Long Sword shares the default move set of most straight swords and deals physical damage. It's a light straight sword in Elden Ring Wang 3.5, and requires a few points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The long sword is a direct upgrade in pretty much every way over the short sword. For only two more strength and 0.5 equip load, you gain 20 to 40 attack rating over every short sword infusion, much longer reach, and you can still deal thrust damage with your R2. The long sword also has the second highest attack rating of all infusible straight swords, being about 10 to 20 points behind the broadsword in nearly every infusion, but it is slightly longer. Fire and Lightning deal the most damage, followed closely by Sacred and Flame Art, with Magic pulling up third. Heavy and Keen deal about the same damage and have about the same scaling, so it doesn't matter which of those you choose. Because both the Lord Sword and Straight Sword and Noble Slender Sword deal only slightly less damage, both have longer reach, and both have higher critical rating, they make a better choice for any sort of block counter build, which means I'd recommend using this in a dual will build or in a spell lay build that takes advantage of the high magic and Sacred and Flame Art scaling. Next is the Broadsword. The Broadsword's R2 attacks are both slashes unlike most other straight swords, and its rolling R1 attack is also a slash and deals physical damage. It has an average weight for a longsword in Elden Ring Wang 4, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Broadsword is the pound for pound king when it comes to attack rating for infusible straight swords, and is the only infusible straight sword that can hang with the unique straight swords when it comes to damage. The downside is that it's shorter than over half the straight swords in Elden Ring, including the Long Sword, Lord Sworn's Straight Sword, and the Noble Slender Sword. It also cannot deal any thrust damage with its R2 attacks, making it less versatile in some ways. Fire and Lightning take the top spot when it comes to damage, followed by Sacred and Flame Art, Magic, and Heavy pulling up close in the fourth spot with Cold not far behind in Fet. The Heavy scaling on this weapon is exceptional and so is Cold by extension, since it scales with strength as well. This puts this weapon in a great spot to use great shields and still deal excellent damage. The downside is that it doesn't have the critical rating of Lord Sworn's Straight Sword or the Reach, but some of this is made up for by the higher attack rating, especially if Cold is being used to set the status effect. Next we come to the Weathered Straight Sword. The Weathered Straight Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical damage. It's very light straight sword in Elden Ring Wang 3, 
and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Weathered Straight Sword is essentially a lower attack rating version of the Short Sword, but with slightly longer reach, a cool visual appearance, and it costs slightly less stamina to swing. In short, the best reason to use this weapon is the lower stamina consumption, particularly if you want to do a wield. This will allow you to hit more times before draining your stamina bar, even though your attacks will deal less damage. Either go with Fire or Lightning for max damage, or go with Bleed or Poison for status effect buildup. Next up is the Lord Sworn Straight Sword. The Lord Sworn Straight Sword shares the default moveset of most Straight Swords and deals physical damage. It's a light Straight Sword in Elden Ring weighing 3.5 and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Lord Sworn Straight Sword might be the most well rounded Straight Sword in Elden Ring. It has the third highest attack rating of all infusible Straight Swords, it's in the top half of Straight Swords when it comes to length, it's lighter than most Straight Swords, and it's tied for the highest critical rating. However, if you're not doing critical attacks that often with this weapon, there are better Straight Swords. Sacred and Flame Art are the highest damage with Fire and Lightning pulling in the close second and Magic not too far behind. Keen and Heavy have nearly identical scaling, but I don't recommend using Heavy since the Broadsword has much better Heavy scaling. Because this weapon has high critical attack, it makes a good candidate for a block counter build that can take advantage of staggers, particularly using the Fire Infusion that will give you solid strength scaling and allow you to use a Great Shield. Another good option is using the Magic Infusion in some sort of Spellblade build, that takes advantage of Glintstone Phalanx Ash of War or the Great Blade Phalanx spell. Up next is the Noble Slender Sword. The Noble Slender Sword shares the default moveset of most straight swords and deals physical damage. It's a light straight sword in Elden Ring, weighing 3.5, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Noble Slender Sword is the longest straight sword in Elden Ring, giving an exceptional reach, and it deals more damage than most other infusible straight swords, even though it doesn't have the highest attack rating. It also has high critical attack, allowing you to dispatch staggered enemies effectively. However, it can take you hours to farm one, and I mean hours. Fire and Lightning deal the most damage with this weapon, with Magic just behind in the second spot, and Flame, Art, and Sacred pulling up third. The weapon does much more damage with the Keen Infusion when compared to Heavy, so I recommend using this one if you can't decide between the two. Because the Noble Slender Sword scales better with Keen than Heavy, it doesn't lend itself as well to block counter builds because strength is needed for Great Shields which make block counters easier to pull off. However, the Fire Infusion solves this issue and I recommend using this one if you want to use it for block counters taking advantage of its length. Additionally, Keen and Cold are still great options for parry builds that don't need heavy shields, but still deal regular critical damage. The next straight sword is the Cane Sword. The Cane Sword shares the moveset of the Broadsword and deals physical damage. It's the lightest straight sword in Elden Ring, weighing 2.5, and requires few points in strength and dexterity in order to use. The Cane Sword and Ornamental Straight Sword are the two lowest attack rating straight swords in Elden Ring, but this one is infusible. It has very short reach, and it's not found until late into the game, making it most likely obsolete by the time you find it. The Fire and Lightning infusions are the best with it, and Magic is just behind with Sacred and Flame Art pulling up third, and Keen edging out heavy by about 20 attack rating. And much like the Weathered Straight Sword and Short Sword, this weapon lends itself well to a dual wield build that takes advantage of the Blue Dancer charm. Lastly, we come to the Warhawk's Talon. The Warhawk's Talon has a unique R2 that swipes two times rapidly, and if charged on the second R2, does another two attacks and deals physical damage. It's a light straight sword in Elden Ring, weighing 3.5, and requires some points in strength and dexterity in order to wield. The Warhawk Talon has roughly the same attack rating as the Noble Slender Sword at nearly every infusion, can take nearly as long to farm but it is a bit shorter and has the Spinning Slash as its Ash of War instead of Square Off. However, its true claim to fame is its unique R2 that slashes twice, and if you hold R2, it will attack two more times, and if you don't hold R2, it will only attack once more. Because the R2 is really the reason to use this weapon, I recommend using it in a build with a shield with a Flame Art Infusion, or in a Spellblade build that uses sorceries or incantations with the Magic or Sacred and Flame Art Infusions. Make sure to use Talismans that reward multiple hits like the Winged Sword Insignia and Millicent's Prothesis, and the Axe Talisman for charged R2 damage. That wraps up our Straight Swords video, and I hope I showed you in this video why Straight Swords are the best weapon in Elden Ring. We will obviously continue this series until we get through all the weapon classes. I'm going to try and get them a little more frequently than this one. I apologize this one took so long. But I would want to know what your guys' thoughts on Straight Swords are. What Straight Swords do you use? How do you play your Straight Sword? Let me know in the comments below.